a young boy, 11 years old, running home through the driving rain to tell some good news to his parents. This young boy who lived in India had just accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Excited to share this news with his family, he ran home into their hut there in India. He told his father with great delight that he'd accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. His father then proceeded to take every belonging the young boy had and throw it out of the hut into the driving rain and said to the young boy, you're out of this family now. Don't you ever call me your father again. What this 11-year-old boy had to face then in trying to find a place to live when you're 11 years old and you've just been cast out of your family. Yet this, what this 11-year-old boy went through, many of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are going through throughout the world today. I read of another family also in India where they were, uh, had just accepted Christ as their savior. The, the woman was pregnant, about to give birth, and the entire village turned down in front of their hut and had the heads of lizards cut off and held these lizards, headless lizards up and said, you must drink this blood to renounce Christ and return to, to our family our village religion. This family refused to do that, and the mom ran back into the hut, grabbed her Bible, and she and her husband fled into the jungle to escape uh, the, the wrath of the fellow, their fellow villagers. She ended up giving birth to her child in the jungle, and they had to find another village and another place to go. I read of a woman in North Korea. She was about 40 years old, and the authorities came to her house one day and discovered that she owned a Bible. And as a result of that, the soldiers grabbed her, took her outside, strapped her to a tree, and shot her dead. Her only crime was having a Bible. This is what many of our brothers and sisters in the Lord face throughout the world today. We here in America are accustomed to being able to worship openly, and because of that, we quite often take it for granted. But we should not the average uh, Christian in the world today is not American. In fact, the average Christian in the world today is not white. The average Christian in the world today is not represented by those of us living in great freedom here in the United States. The average Christian in the world today faces challenges that you and I would consider to be impossible to face. And they are impossible to face without God. So today we're going to spend some time talking about this. Why would we talk about this? Well, it's because in Hebrews 13 we're told to. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 3, the writer of Hebrews says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. The context of this passage is talking about those who have been imprisoned because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And we, those of us outside of those chains, are to remember those and think about those who are in chains, who are being held, who are being punished and persecuted for their faith. We are to remember them. And when the Bible uses the word remember, it's not using it in a passive sense like we are often used to think of, oh yeah, I remember that time that we you know, did this or did that. When the Bible talks about the word remember, when it uses this word, go back, look under the hood, look at the Greek, the context here is talking about actively meditating on it, thinking about it, actively praying for these people. They should be at the forefront of our mind on a regular basis. We should be actively remembering them in prayer before our Lord because they need our prayers. And we, if we were in their situation, we would want to know that there are people praying for us. And thank God that we have the privilege of living in the United States of America, but we must remember those who do not have that privilege. And even as we live in the United States of America, as we're going to address in a few minutes, we cannot be guaranteed that our religious freedom will last forever. The global persecution of Christians presents a grim picture. Over 75% of the world's population, according to the Pew Research Center, lives in areas of intense religious persecution. That's an estimate of 5.5 billion people. Of those people, about 100 million Christians endure persecution today. Now, I want to explain that statistic. That's not talking about the number of Christians who happen to live in areas of persecution. This 100 million figure is talking about Christians who are actively right now feeling the brunt of persecution. Christians who are right now homeless because of their faith. 
Christians who are right now in prison because of their faith. Christians who are right now in concentration camps, and yes, they exist in the world today because of their faith. Christians who are actively being persecuted, the number is about 100 million. Approximately 322 Christians are killed on average each month for their faith, according to Open Doors USA. John Allen, writing in the book The Global War on Christians, writes, Christians today indisputably are the most persecuted religious body on the planet, and too often their martyrs suffer in silence. The Catholic organization Aid to the Church in Need writes that the persecution of Christians is a human rights disaster of epic proportions. Now, there are many reasons why the media doesn't cover this like they should, and I don't have time today to get into all that, but there's all kinds of reasons for the neglect of our media to mention this. But make no mistake about it. The, the data is abundantly clear. Christians are the most persecuted religious group on the planet today. No religion, not Judaism, not Islam, not Buddhism, not Hinduism, not atheism, no religion faces the kind of persecution that Christians do. We are the persecuted church today. In their book, Paul Marshall, Layla Gilbert, and Nina Shea, in their book, Persecuted, the Global Assault on Christians, they write this. Most persecution of Christians springs from one of three causes. First is the hunger for total political control exhibited by the communist and post-communist regimes. The second is the desire by some to preserve Hindu or Buddhist privilege, as is evident in South Asia. The third is radical Islam's urge for religious dominance, which at present is generating an expanding global crisis. If you break that down and look at the, the motives behind it, it's the big three motives, control, privilege, and dominance. The desire of the powers that be in the respective cultures to have control over the population, to have privilege for certain members of that, of that society, to, ex to have privilege over other members of the society. And you see this in the caste system, for example, in India. You've got different classes are privileged and so forth. And Christians are not very highly privileged right now in India. Uh, you see um, uh, the desire for control, frankly, going back to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire didn't really care what your personal beliefs were. They didn't care if you worshipped a bunch of gods as long as you worshipped their god. As long as you were paying your taxes and doing what the Romans wanted you to do, they were okay. The Roman motivation behind persecution was control. Contrast that with the Jewish, the Jewish persecution of Christians in the, in the New Testament. Uh, that persecution was based on the need for religious dominance. Uh, and they saw the Christians as heretics and blasphemers, and that's why our Lord was persecuted. And so you have different causes of Christian persecution in the world today. But ultimately, they come down to these motives and understand that we're talking about human nature here. We're talking about human beings. And I do not want us to go away today pointing the finger at Muslims or Jews or atheists or whatever and saying they're the bad guys because Christians themselves can sometimes be guilty of persecution. Over the course of history, we Christians have persecuted others to our shame. And, and in fact, there are countries today which have majority Christian populations where persecution takes place in those countries. So I am not pointing the finger at any racial group or any religious group. I'm simply saying, human nature being what it is, persecution is inevitable if you are following Jesus Christ. You will encounter resistance. Paul tells us that in Romans, they tells us that the average person suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. We'll get to that slide in a second. The average truth the average person suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. And as a result of that, we as Christians, we bring the truth. And there are people in the world today that are going to want to suppress that truth. Uh, and so we will face persecution. Jesus tells us this. And we would be uh, remiss if we thought that we are exempt from persecution here in the United States of America. If I wanted to, I could alarm all of you. There are all kinds of stories and, and news events out there taking place in the U.S. of A. right now where Christians are beginning to face some persecution. I'm talking about Christians that are losing their jobs and being fired because of their faith. I'm talking about uh, religious organizations. For example, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship has been kicked off all of the public campuses in California because they require that all of their officers subscribe to their statement of faith. Now, I want you to hear that again. 
InterVarsity Christian Fellowship has a policy that all of its officers, anyone who serves as an officer in their InterVarsity Christian Fellowship chapter, that's how I met my wife. I was actually a ch- uh, an officer in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at George Mason University. InterVarsity's policy is that anyone who is an officer in, in the InterVarsity Club must agree to the statement of faith. Well, that's our policy here as a church. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a deacon, for example, you're gonna have to abide by your statement of faith. If you're gonna teach Sunday school, you've got to abide by your statement of faith. So InterVarsity has that same policy. If you're gonna be an officer in our club, you must abide by the by our statement of faith. The state of California says that's discriminatory, and the state of California now does not recognize InterVarsity on its college campuses. That kind of thing is happening in the United States of America, and that's just one of many examples I could give you. So you would be wrong to assume that because of the wisdom of our founding fathers that we are permanently exempt from persecution in the United States. The signs are there, the writing's on the wall, that we could be facing some trouble here in America in the not-too-distant future. And that is why A few years ago, the late Cardinal Francis George of Chicago said this, I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison, and his successor will die a martyr in the public square. He's talking about America. But I want to spend our time today not so much bemoaning the circumstances of our country or the world. I want to talk about what we can do about it and what our reaction as a church should be. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, Do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And I want to talk about how we, as God's people, can overcome the evil of persecution with good. What can we do? And there are several things I believe that we can do. And first, I believe in this context, it begins with awareness. We must be aware that the persecution is happening. Jesus tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. A lot of people leave out that wise as serpents part. We need to actually be wise. We need to be aware. Uh, The men of Issachar, the Old Testament tells us, were men who understood the times. And there are many Christians today who are clueless about the times in which we live in. We go about our business and we we do our routines and, and all of that, and we're just clueless about what's happening in the world around us or even in our own communities. We need to be aware that we live in a world that is still, even now, 2,000 years after the New Testament was written, is still hostile to Jesus Christ. We live in a world full of people who want to, frankly, snuff out the gospel of Jesus Christ and destroy all of Christ's followers. We must be aware of this danger. We must be aware of the circumstances that that we are faced with today. We must be aware that this persecution is happening. We must be aware that this persecution can happen in some forms, even, even in our own backyard. The second thing we need to do is we need to be full of worship. Now, when I was first preparing this message, I went into this message thinking, you know, I'm just going to try to preach a message so that we will all feel great compassion and sorrow for the persecuted church. And I do believe we should feel compassion and sorrow for the persecuted church, but God opened up a whole other dimension to me as I prepared this sermon. And it's illustrated by, uh, I was listening to a, to a message preached by the head of Voices of the Martyrs, and he is a He is a um, Korean pastor. He's actually an American, married a Korean. He's over in Korea now, pastoring in Korea, and he does outreach to the North Korean underground church. And he was meeting with one of the North Korean pastors. And this American pastor talking to this North Korean pastor, and the American pastor said, what can I get you? You know, how, how can I pray for you? Uh, and he says, you know, I've got, I've got a whole bunch of stuff here for you that I can give you. So, so what, what do you need and how can I pray for you? The North Korean pastor smiled and said, you pray for me, we're praying for you. And he looked at me and he looked at me, what are you talking about? You're praying for me. I've got, I've, got, I've got a whole bunch of Bibles here I can give you. I've got a whole bunch of kinds of stuff. And he said, you know, that's your problem, you Americans. You put your trust in your freedom and in your money and in your resources. We put our trust in the Lord. What Daniel said a few minutes ago is absolutely true. In the persecuted church, you don't, in, in the areas where there's a persecuted church, you don't have any nominal Christians. You don't have any Christians who are walking, you know, by sight and not by faith. And, and, and these parts, the Christians that are out there, they're the real deal, ladies and gentlemen. They're the real deal. And we need to be aware of that. Let me tell you something that will really convict you. Francis Chan, I was listening to a message that he preached the other day. 
And Francis Chan was talking about how he interacted with some Chinese Christians, some Chinese Christian students. And, and he looked at them and said, tell me, I want to I hear about some of your persecution stories. And they looked at him like he had three heads. And he, and he said, you know, I, maybe I'm not explaining myself. I want to hear about how you're, how you're persecuted. And they looked at him like, what are you talking about? And in the course of this conversation, he realized that, that what he was asking, it was like it was a strange thing for him. Like it's an extraordinary thing to face persecution for your faith. But for these Chinese students, it was the routine. It was the norm. It was, it'd be like asking, tell me about the last time you went to church. You know, like we, we go to church all the time, right? Well, they face persecution all the time over there. It's routine. They deal with it. It's part of their life. It's part of their worship. And they understand that. And so they finally said, well, tell us about, about your country. And so Francis Chan then began to explain church in America. And in the course of him explaining church in America, he found these Chinese students started to laugh. Not just laugh a little bit, but laugh uproariously at him. And he wasn't even trying to be funny. But as he looked back on his comments, he realized how comical it was to these Chinese Christians. Because the way he was describing it, see, well, in America, we have freedom of religion. So in America, there's all kinds of churches in our communities. And we can choose which church we go to every Sunday. We can choose to go to the church here. We can choose to go to the church over here. In fact, if we go to the church over here, and we don't like what the pastor's saying, we can go to the church over here, you know? And if we go, if, if we go to the church here, we don't like the music, and we don't like how something's done, we, we can just switch and go to this church over here. And as he was explaining this, the Chinese Christians thought this was funny. And they thought he was kidding, and he wasn't. That ought to convict you. We have adopted a consumerist mentality here in America, where we look at church as a commodity because it is common. And we look at it as a commodity, and we want church to simply help us. We want it to be therapeutic for us. We want it to, to make us feel good. And if, and if the church I'm attending doesn't make me feel good, well, then I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to go to another church, and that church makes me feel good. And that's laughable to the persecuted church. They are sacrificing their lives just to go to church, just to join with their brothers and sisters in Christ in worship. And here in America, we have this consumerist mentality. Now, I want, I'm going to step on some toes right now, but quite frankly, I don't care. So here it comes. I find that even here in our church, the, the flesh can get, can get the best of us because we end up starting to get our nose bent out of joint and our feelings hurt and our anger starts to build over stuff that's just not that important in the grand scheme of things. And our priorities get completely out of whack. That is not the case overseas in the persecuted church, ladies and gentlemen. They understand their priorities. Francis Chan was talking about a worship service that he went to where uh, one of the guys was playing a guitar and the, and, the, and the students were all singing and stuff. And these were, these were people who had escaped from a, from a country of persecution. And they were, they were having a great old time. And he said most of them couldn't carry two in the bucket. And the guitar player was no good. But no one cared about any of that. They were praising Jesus. Now here in America, I'm not saying that we should be lazy and that we shouldn't put our best foot forward and we shouldn't give God our best. I believe that's the case. I believe things should be done decently and in order. But if you find yourself, and I want to be very clear on this, if you find yourself becoming so angry and emotional and bitter and upset because things in church aren't going the way you think things should be going in church, remember the persecuted church. Get your priorities right. Get your head in the game. And if your head isn't right, maybe you need to step back for a little while and just worship and get your head right again. You know, Paul tells in Philippians 2, do all things without murmuring and disputing. And that's often preached like, well, listen, when you're in the traffic and, 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 and someone cuts you off, you know, make sure you don't complain. And that's okay to preach it that way. I've preached it that way myself because it's true, and I have to remember that. But you know, that's really not the context. Paul was writing to the church, and he was telling the church not to complain. Don't do the church stuff that you're doing and complain about it. Don't 
complain in the church. That's what Paul is saying. And don't tell me, well, that doesn't apply to my situation, Pastor. Paul was talking about the church, and he was talking to a church that was under persecution. If you're upset about things, you take it to the Lord in prayer and let God change your heart. If someone has sinned against you, there's Matthew 18. You've got the procedure to go through for Matthew 18. But otherwise, keep your focus on the Lord. Worship him and him only. Church is not about you. It is about Jesus and no one else. And then third, we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer for the persecuted church and prayer for ourselves. We need to be making sure that we are continually remembering these people for what they're doing, for what they're going through. And prayer works. You ever step back and just recognize, I mean, this prayer thing really works, you know? It's like, I, I, I remember many times I've been praying for something, and you know, we can be honest, we're in church, let's be honest. Sometimes, you know, it's like, yeah, I know I need to pray about it. Okay, I'm praying about it. But we don't really expect anything to come out of that, right? You know, we're just praying. And then isn't it cool when God answers your prayer? And it's like, and I'm, I'll be praying for some situation, and I just, I'm praying for it. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I know I'm going to have to kind of fix this on my own, you know. But yet I pray and I pray and I'm, I'm truly praying for it, and yet God will fix it. And I'm like, well, God, you are cool, you know. This, this is really good, you know. The point is, there is power, ladies and gentlemen, in prayer. There's power in prayer. And I know I've been through situations where I can, it's hard to explain, but I can sense the fact that people are praying for me as I go through a situation. And you know, the folks overseas, they're not really asking for any special favors from us, but they do want us to pray for them. And that's the least we can do, is to pray for them. And that's not just a minor token thing, yeah, we'll pray for them, but if we really are serious about that, if we really are praying for them, God's going to hear our prayers, he's going to bless our prayers, and he's going to bless them because of our prayers. And so let's make sure that we're praying continually for the persecuted church. Let's make sure that we show our solidarity and support with them when we can. There are groups like Open Doors USA, like the International Missions Board for the SBC here, that do things to help persecuted Christians overseas. And to the extent that we can, we need to show our solidarity and support. That does include financial giving. You know, we need to do what we can. Let's raise some money and send some Bibles to North Korea. Let's do what we can to get the gospel out there. That shows that we are invested, that we care, that we aren't just paying lip service to it. And we can, show, we can show encouragement to these missionaries overseas. Do you know how much it means when you're going through a tough time to have someone that you like and trust or another brother and sister in Christ come to you and say, hey, I love you and I'm praying for you. We need to do that for our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. As they're facing this persecution, let's be sure to lift them up and let them know that we're lifting them up in prayer. Let's encourage them. Barnabas went to all the cities that were experiencing persecution, and he encouraged them and strengthened them in the Lord. And that's why Barnabas is known as a great encourager. And we need to be that kind of encourager for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as appropriate, we should also engage in political and legal action. Now, in some churches, it's taboo to even talk about politics. Those of you that are visiting, for those of you that have only been here a little bit of time, I will never endorse a candy from this pulpit, so you can all relax. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, vote your conscience, pray, and ask God for wisdom on this crazy election. But I will tell you this, certainly when it comes to the two major party candidates, and I would imagine all the third party candidates too, no candidate on the ballot is the savior of our country. And no candidate is going to solve all of our problems. Only Jesus can solve our problems. So... I'm going to lift up Jesus during this election season because that's what we should lift up, lift up the Son of Man, you know, lift up the Son of Man in our, in our culture today. Well, but that being said, we should not be totally uh, divorced from the political situation. I know some Christians that they actually believe that Christians should never do anything political. Christians shouldn't vote. Christians shouldn't say anything. shouldn't even say the word politics. And whenever I hear that, I've got to be honest with you, this is where my anger comes out. When I hear someone say something like that, I want to ship them off to North Korea, frankly. (laughs) And I mean it. I get really angry when I hear that. I'm like, do you have any idea 
Do you have any idea what you're talking about? Politics matters. The law matters. And I thank God that there are organizations out there that are fighting for religious freedom in our courts, not just in America, but around the world. I thank God for them. And we should not hesitate to do what we can to write our representatives in Congress, to write our senators, to write our governors, to write our president, and be a voice for religious freedom in America. We should take that action. And we, when we have someone that's been wrongly imprisoned, like Pastor Saeed in Iran, we should write the State Department and write and do all these things to try to, we, got, we still have, you know there are still Christians in prison around the world today. And we should be writing the State Department. We should be saying, do some action here, help these people. We need to be, when it's appropriate, taking legal and political action. And ladies and gentlemen, if any of you disagree with me, let me just say quite bluntly, you are wrong because I am standing on solid biblical ground here. Read the book of Acts. And you will find that Paul cited his Roman citizenship on several occasions. Paul, when he was about to be beaten and flogged, said, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman? And, and they had to stop, and they didn't beat him. That's citing his Roman citizenship. Paul also, when they brought him before Festus and Agrippa, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And then, because of that, they said, well, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And then he went and had a little shipwreck thing in Malta and stuff like that. But eventually, <laughs> he made it to Rome. All right, and, uh, and so the point is that, that Paul knew how to play the political game, and he did. And we as Christians are stupidly ignorant today quite often. We need to know, frankly, and I don't mean that it's a game, but we need to know how to play. We need to know the rules. We need to know what our rights are. You know, you know how many Christians, I wonder how many, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, um, I don't want to put you in a situation where you feel like you have to lie, not to be embarrassed. But I wonder how many Christians living in the United States of America have ever actually read the Constitution. I wonder how many have actually read the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, or, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble. How many of you have actually read that? How many people... Have, having, how many people in America actually know the difference between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States? Or which came first? I mean, I know some people that are so ignorant about history that if you asked them which came first, World War I or World War II, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't know for sure. <laughs> the truth is that we are taking what God has given us and we're squandering it. And the Bible is clear. We just went through Stewardship Month. The Bible is clear that we're responsible for what God has given us, and God has given us. I mean, do you, do you have any idea what God has given you? You were able to get in your car and drive to church this morning, and the only concern you had with respect to our civil government was you didn't want to get a speeding ticket. The only concern that we have relevant in our relationship with Montgomery County right now is these stupid speed cameras out here on Georgia <laughs> Avenue. But that is, that, that is it. We are blessed, ladies and gentlemen, in this country. We are abundantly blessed. And we need to thank God for that, and we need to not squander it. I know my Constitution and my Declaration of Independence not because I try to show up, because I'm a United States citizen. And I have a responsibility as a citizen of the kingdom of God to carry the gospel far and wide, and I'm going to use whatever the civil government gives me as a resource to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what the Apostle Paul did. And if it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me, and it's good enough for you too. Make sure that you are a good steward of what you've been given. But finally, the real key to overcoming evil with good, and all of what I just said is important, but the real key to overcoming evil with good is the Great Commission. It's bringing the gospel. The more people who get saved, the fewer people out there that are going to persecute you for being saved. Uh, you see, the Vikings... And this is funny. I, I, you know, the Vikings were known for their, for their raiding and pillaging and all of that. That's what they were, they were known for uh, and their great Viking ships and stuff.
But even secular historians will tell you there's a reason why all of a sudden they just stopped doing it. I mean, if you look at history, it's like the, the, their Vikings are pillaging and raiding and doing all these, all these crazy things. In fact, attacking churches, even in, in England. And all of a sudden, they just stopped. And historians scratch their heads, and they're like, why did they do it? And there's been all kinds of studies done. And the real reason, Amer not American, excuse me, but Christian missionaries went up and began to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Vikings. And they became Christians. When they became Christians, they realized... I guess we've got to find another line of work. <laughs> this whole pillaging and tearing up property is not Christ-like. And so they eventually gave that up. The fact of the matter is Jesus changes hearts. And as we advance the kingdom of God, as we advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, the walls of persecution begin to come down. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to close on some good news here. In China, as Daniel just told you, the estimates are 100 million people in China are now worshiping Jesus Christ outside of the established church. Do you realize that Mao Zedong did everything he could to purge Christianity from, from China? And yet, Christianity is alive and well. There are more Christians, more people in China who identify as Christians than there are members of the Communist Party in China today. China is a mission field about to explode. The Chinese government, they're the ones that ought to be worried, not the people of God. The, the pastor I just told you about, about who's ministering to the people of North Korea, he will tell you that the real heartbeat of the church is actually in North Korea, even more than South Korea, which is an incredible statement to make when you consider that nine of the ten largest churches in America are in South Korea. South Korea is, is considered to be, you know, almost more Christian now than America. South Korea sends out per capita more missionaries than any other country in the world today. If you want to go and see a real Christian country, you know, what a real Christian country looks like today, you can go to South Korea and you will see that. South Korea is very openly about their Christian faith, but yet the real heartbeat of the church where the most, the most fearsome, devoted disciples of Jesus Christ can be found is in the north. And there is a spiritual warfare going on, ladies and gentlemen, in the north. You see, when Kim Il-sung became the dictator in North Korea, he introduced a new philosophy into the North Korean people, the Juche philosophy, which is a, a political, social, and economic philosophy, but it also has a religious component because it took in the cult of personality that Kim Il-sung has, and it incorporated that into the Juche philosophy. And so now the people of North Korea gather on a regular basis, and they worship Kim Il-sung. And, of course, now Kim Jong-un, who's kind of crazy if you follow the news. But they still, Kim Il-sung is considered to be uh, the, the great leader. Uh, he is the eternal head of state in North Korea. And people gather to him on a regular basis. Pictures of him adorn the walls of every home in North Korea. Every single citizen of North Korea is expected to attend what is in essence a church service every week to worship Kim Il-sung and to worship um, the, the, the philosophy of Juche and all that in North Korea. But if you were to go and really actually analyze that, you will find that Kim Il-sung stole from the Bible in order to, in order to um, create his philosophy. And so many of the hymns that are sung in these churches are actually Christian hymns where Kim Il-sung's name has replaced the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason he was able to get away with this is because there was a systematic purge of Christians when Kim Il-sung came to power. North Korea is considered to be the most barbarous and the most um, uh, antagonistic place in the world toward, toward Christians. And Kim Il-sung uh, was successful, politically speaking. But underground, there are many people who know the truth and who are proclaiming the truth. And the North Korean church today is not shrinking, it is growing. And one of the most interesting things from this is North Korea has this competition with South Korea over time. And, they, and, and one time early on, this is amazing when you think about it, the North Koreans tried to present themselves to the world as being a free country. You know, communist countries are known for their propaganda. Cuba, for example, tries to put a face to the world that it's a free nation, but when you get there, it's, the story is very different. North Korea has tried to do the same thing. North Korea actually printed at taxpayer expense a Bible in the North Korean language, in the North Korean dialect and presented that to the world as evidence that we have religious freedom. Of course, none of those Bibles were circulating at that time in North Korea. 
until the underground church got a hold of that Bible and began to spread that Bible and mass produce that Bible. And now, even though only 500 Bibles were, were originally printed and presented outside of North Korea, now tens of thousands of those Bibles are circulating within North Korea. God used the foolishness of the North Korean government to bring his truth to the people of North Korea. I want to close by saying, as this praise band comes forward, um, well, actually, never mind, we're going to be doing a prayer, time of prayer. But I want to close by saying that the 11-year-old boy I told you about at the beginning of my message, um, I don't remember the boy's name, but he is now a grown man. He's now a pastor. He's now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. His father and him are now reconciled because his father accepted Christ as his Savior. The truth is that when it comes to overcoming evil with good, we know, as it says in Job, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will stand on the earth. We have many brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering now. We need to pray for them. But we are on the winning side. And all of these martyrs that have gone before us and all those who are now, who are now facing tremendous persecution, all of them, along with us, will one day see the promise of this verse when Jesus Christ stands on the earth once more. And we know, as Paul says, that in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We do not need to necessarily feel sorry for the people overseas. We just need to pray for them, to remember them, to lift them up, to pray that God will strengthen them through this, to do what we can to help them. But ultimately, let us all take stock in knowing we are on the winning side. Our Redeemer lives. I'm going to pray right now, and then I'm going to ask you to just take a moment of silent prayer after I pray. And then uh, we are actually going to dismiss on this, uh, on this somber note because um, what we're observing today is very important. So I'm going to pray. There's going to be a few moments of silent prayer. And I just want you to take a few moments now and pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. And after just a couple minutes of silent prayer, Brother Tong Sambulin is going to come up and close us in prayer today for our service. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done. Father, I thank you for the great freedom that we have in the United States of America. But Father, may our hope not be in the United States. May our hope not be in the American flag. As much as I personally love America, as much as I love the flag, and as much as I believe it's important for us to vote on Tuesday, our hope cannot be in America. Our hope cannot be in our political situation or in any candidate or party our hope must be in you. And Father, the hope, uh, our hope must be in you. We must pray for the strengthening of that hope in our brothers and sisters overseas, people living in countries that are much more hostile to Christianity than what we live in. Father, their hope must not be in their government. Their hope must be in you. So Father, I pray that you will help all of us, Lord, to remember that, to thank you for what you've blessed us here with, but to place our hope in you, our trust in you, to maintain the proper attitude of worship, to keep our priorities in check, to keep our mind in check, Lord, and to lift up in solidarity and encouragement and prayer our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. We ask all this in your Son's holy and precious name as we now enter into a time of silent prayer.